While some bacteria are good for us and some are bad, it's not the case with viruses. All viruses are bad. They are strange microorganisms, not made of cells and extremely small, between 0.02 micrometers and about 0.3 micrometers. They are smaller than half a wavelength of light, so you can't even see them with a light microscope. And they're about 50 times smaller than your average bacteria. They're made of protein with some genetic material inside. And in simple terms, what they do is they invade living cells, hijack the cell's machinery, and cause the cells to make more copies of the virus. And in that way, they can all be classed as parasites. So what about virus structure? Well, viruses are made up of, as I said, a protein coat, and we call that the capsid. Within that is genetic material. This is either RNA or DNA. There is also sometimes an envelope, which is made from lipids that are taken from the host cell. The capsid is made up of simple repeated units of protein called capsomeres. There are also virus attachment particles, VAPs, uh, these are antigens which are specific to the surface proteins of the host cell. These are sometimes called spike proteins and they're involved in how the virus invades the host cell. So how do we classify viruses? Well, the first type of virus we'll look at are called DNA viruses. And unsurprisingly, they contain viral DNA. And that DNA is used as a template to make the new viral DNA. An example of this is the lambda phage virus. Now this is a type of bacteriophage which actually infect bacteria. Yes, not even bacteria are safe from viruses. These viruses infect bacteria. Now the fact that these phage viruses infect bacteria with the viral DNA, well humans have made the most of that trait and actually changed the DNA inside the virus so that the virus delivers new DNA to the bacteria that we want so we can genetically engineer them. The second type of viruses are RNA viruses. These account for about 70% of viruses. They contain RNA and they are very likely to mutate. The majority of these viruses contain a single strand of RNA, so we call them SSRNA viruses. Some are positive sent SSRNA viruses, where the RNA acts directly as messenger RNA does, and the viral RNA can be translated directly into proteins. An example of this is the tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, the virus affects plants such as tobacco and causes a mottling effect on the leaves that looks like a mosaic. The negative sense SSRNA viruses are where the RNA must be first transcribed before it gets to the ribosomes. An example of this type of virus is Ebola. So Ebola is a virus that we'll talk a bit more about later on in this video, which is spread from person to person via direct contact with bodily fluids, such as blood. The final type of virus to talk about here are the RNA retroviruses. Now these have a lipid envelope as part of their structure. The single strand of RNA codes for an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. This reverse transcriptase goes on to make the viral DNA because it does transcription in reverse. So it takes RNA and turns it back into DNA. So in this case, the RNA codes for that uh, enzyme and that takes the RNA and turns it back into DNA, which can then be incorporated into the host's DNA. And this will code for the viral proteins and the RNA. An example of this is the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. Now, HIV is a virus that attacks your immune system and limits your ability to fight off secondary infections. This can then lead to you developing acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. So here are the three types of virus, DNA viruses, RNA viruses, and RNA retroviruses. So I've talked a little bit about this, we need to go into more detail about how a virus actually works. Well, viruses can only reproduce inside a living cell. To do this, the virus must first enter the cell through the plasma membrane and, if present, the cell wall. Viruses do so by either attaching to a receptor on the cell's surface or by simple mechanical force. The virus then releases its genetic material, the DNA or the RNA, 
into the cell. Most viruses get into animal cells via endocytosis at the cell membrane. A bacteriophage, as already mentioned, injects the genome into a bacterial cell. And plant viruses get in using a vector quite often, such as an insect which pierces the cell wall and then the virus can get in. For example, this flat mite which transmits many plant viruses, such as the coffee ring spot virus. Once the virus is inside the host cell, it can then take various routes to replicate itself based on what type of virus it is. DNA viruses can work in two ways, the lytic cycle or latency, the lysogenic cycle. So the lytic cycle, viruses that do this are called virulent. The viral DNA is replicated separately from the host's DNA. All the virus proteins are also made using the cell's machinery and the new virus self-assembles using the DNA that it's replicated separately and the proteins that have been manufactured into new copies of the virus. And once lots and lots and lots of these new copies have been manufactured, eventually the cell will actually burst, uh, which we call lysis, and that will release all these new viruses out and they will go and do the same thing to other host cells. Latency or the lysogenic cycle is uh, viruses that we, are, that we call non-virulent. Now in this case the viral DNA gets inserted into the host's DNA. It joins in with the host's genome. This is what we call a provirus. They like to keep the host cell alive and so when the cell divides it also takes with it this new provirus each time. The viral DNA codes for a repressor gene that stops the rest of the genome being read. Therefore, the virus at this point has no effect. It is completely dormant or latent. At some point though, a trigger will happen that will reduce the repressor gene quantity and the virus can then enter the lytic cycle and continue to reproduce in the way we've already described. What about drugs against viruses? Well, so far scientists have not been able to make drugs that actually kill the viruses themselves. They cannot cure virus viral diseases, but they can delay the onset of symptoms and reduce the amount of time someone is ill. Antiviral drugs work by inhibiting the ways in which viruses replicate, and they can do this in the following three ways. Number one, blocking the virus from the host cell by targeting the receptors that viruses use to recognize the host cells. Number two, target the enzymes that an infected host cell uses to assemble new viral DNA or RNA. Number three, protease inhibitors can be used to stop the new viruses budding from the host membrane, and these are very effective in treating HIV. What about developing new drugs? Well, this can take up to 10 years, and there are various stages that you have to go through. The first is the research stage, uh, and where identification of active ingredients happens. Once that has happened, you can then move into animal testing phases, which is followed by three phases of human clinical trials before the review of, of the drug by regulating bodies. Only then is the drug available, and even then there'll be post-availability studies that go on. This is a very strict set of regulations. However, in times of epidemic, the process may be speeded up to try and save lives. This obviously is risky and has some significant ethical implications that need to be considered. The World Health Organization and local authorities would consider some of the following questions very carefully before using a drug that was not that had not completed its full set of trials. First of all, you've got to think about how much of the drug is actually available at that point. Who should get the drug, especially if it's um, in short supply? Is there a freedom of choice? Can they get truly informed consent? What are the current known side effects and are they worse than the, the disease itself? What are the current outcomes of the disease? What other potential treatments are available? An example of this we can look at is the, within the Ebola outbreak that happened in 2014. The WHO approved a drug called ZMAP, and it was found that survivors of Ebola had raised levels of certain antibodies. Scientists then genetically engineered tobacco plants 
to produce these antibodies. Because the mortality rate was so high for Ebola, and the drugs had been successfully trialled on monkeys, so they'd gone through the animal testing phase, they decided to start using them. However, there was only a small amount of the drug available, so actually only seven people were treated. And the mortality rate of these patients was similar, so a bigger trial would need to happen before any conclusions could be drawn. The first outbreak of the Ebola epidemic actually happened in late 2013, but it took about six months before the world realised how serious it was. This map here shows the outbreak uh, as of the 8th of August 2014, with the orange shaded countries showing where there are confirmed cases. Ebola is caused by the Ebola virus. It's an animal disease that can spread to humans through the meat or body fluids of animals. It can then pass from person to person if the skin of a healthy person comes into contact with blood, faeces or bodily fluids from an infected person. As already discussed, viral diseases are extremely hard to treat. Therefore, preventing their transmission in the first place is the best approach. You can either do this using vaccination or methods uh, that prevent the spread. Vaccination is very effective and has helped eliminate many diseases that have killed millions of humans. If an epidemic occurs, you should vaccinate the healthy individuals around the outbreak to make them immune and stop the spread. Scientists have not made a vaccine against all viruses yet. Two vaccines for Ebola have been fast-tracked to get them to market as soon as possible. There are various ways you can just stop a disease spreading. Educate people about basic hygiene, make sure public spaces are cleaned, make sure disease is easy diagnosed in the first place, sterilization of equipment in medical facilities and correct disposal techniques, clean water, effective sewage works, and keeping people infected in isolation.